Hey guys, welcome to RC Gearing 101. And if you watch the channel, you know we have the 101 series geared towards new people to help them understand the hobby they're in. This one here is all about gears and it's a response video for people that have asked us, you know, we've covered batteries, we've covered shocks, we've covered differentials, all kinds of stuff in the 101 series but we never actually touched on gearing. And gearing is an important part of keeping your car running for a long period of time. It's one of those things. If you look on the bench behind me, and we'll show you a close up of this, you'll see that there's a lot involved in getting your car to run the right length without overheating and burning down parts and all the stuff that goes with it, everything counts. In this video, we're gonna go over all that with you so you'll understand how to choose the right gearing for your application. This should be a lot of fun, guys. Check this out. Okay, so let's get straight into this, but it's not as simple as pinion and spur gear as far as that goes. There's a lot of components that play a good role in it, and they go anywhere from the differential gearing to the center diff gearing to the tire size battery size, brushed or brushless, and all of that good stuff, and everything plays a role. The weight of the car, the size of the tires play a big role in it as well, but let's discuss torque for just a minute. Each motor is designed for the vehicle that it comes with to handle the weight of the tires and all of the drivetrain to pull a certain amount of amperage through the system so everything runs smoothly. When you start playing with gearing, you throw more load on it. And one of the best ways I know to explain how that works is with our hex drivers. And this is how this works here. So if you take a hex driver with a small head on it, and yes, this one is designed to go in a tool, but for our purposes, this is just a small handle. Okay, so the size of the handle versus the size of the driving shaft. Think of it as pinion and motor kind of combination here. So what we have here is this is where we're going to grip it. And you can grip it as hard as you want without using pliers or cheating. Just grab it with your fingers and twist on it. And you can only get so many pounds or inch pounds of torque against that head. But look at this one now. Look at the size of the barrel on this. This changes things dramatically from the same size head. So they're the same on the end. They're the same size, okay, 2.5 millimeter. But at the same time, when you get to this end, it is infinitely bigger than this end. So when you grab the barrel and you twist, it's not a matter of grip here. It's not how good you can grip because you can grip this well too. If you just get a good bite on it, you can still get a good grip, but you don't have as much surface area. So your twisting ability is limited. However, with this one, you can get way more torque against the situation. Now let's reverse that for a second and look at it from this end. This end is the motor. This is the pinion. Okay. So now the motor has to fight. If this is a large pinion, the motor has to fight the difference between A and B giving it a lot less torque against it. Now, when it does speed up, this will travel a lot faster because there's more teeth It'll, for each rotation. You'll get more rotation against the spur gear if this is your pinion. However, if this is your pinion and it's small, the motor turns this easily. So it's lower amp draw on the motor, lower amp draw on the motor, lower amps going through the speed control, lower draw on the battery, all that plays a role. So with a small pinion, it turns easily, but it doesn't go as fast because it doesn't have as many teeth. So each rotation moves the car less distance. So when you change up to a large pinion, the motor has to fight, especially on startup, to get it spinning. Once it's spinning, yes, you can get higher speeds, but you're talking a lot higher temperatures. And there are many ways that you can combat that heat. And one of them is to install a heat sink with a fan onto the motor itself. And that will help dissipate some of the heat that's drawn. This will get you a little more out of it, but at the same time, it won't solve all your problems. And they do make them in many different sizes. So that's cool. This is one way to combat that heat generation from gearing it up higher. You also should have a fan on your speed control, unless it's a brushed system 
and the brushed ones generally don't have the speed control installed so they don't take that heat as easily the brushless systems generally do have that and that is one way to handle that but at the same time the gearing plays a huge role and before we get into the gearing and that type of thing we got to talk about the amp draw here because that's really important to this. So over there on the bench is the Max 10 and that is an easy run from Hobby Wing. And I did pull out a manual that goes to it to check the numbers here to make sure we got this right. And what it comes down to is real simple. They have a peak and an average draw rating on these things. So the steady current that can be drawn on that particular speed control is 120 amps continuous, but it can peak all the way up to 830. Now here's the thing, on these brushless ones, you may not be able to see this down inside here. I'll try and get you a close up picture of this, but down inside here are capacitors and the capacitors charge when you plug it in. Now these don't hold a charge, they build a charge. So what happens is these can discharge like that. They can discharge really quickly, but once they're drained, you're pulling directly on the battery. That's how that works with these things. So you can get your 830 amps on your peak when you first pull the trigger, and then it drops down to whatever the current draw is that this will handle. And then of course the throttle amount that you choose will dictate how much is sent to the motor. And that's how those work. That makes a big difference there. If you think about it, if you're constantly playing with the throttle, zip, 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 you're pulling a lot of amps into that motor by peaking it a lot. And when you peak a lot, you throw way more amperage at the car. Yes, the car's a lot of fun to play with that way, but keep an eye on your temps at that because the motor's getting a lot more current than it's supposed to. And the batteries only send up to a certain amount of steady pull. Remember, if you have, if you have a battery here, like see this one here, this one there is and if you want to know about batteries you have batteries 101 it's in the playlist and of course that's going to be right up there the link for it but this is 500 or 5200 milliamp hours which is the size of the battery how long it will run but the c rating this is 50 c that's how many amps it can comfortably draw without damaging the battery so this will go up to 50 c so the car can only run continuously on what the amp draw from the battery is. That's why these people are always, you see them on the channels and they're always running like 100, 120 amp um, C batteries because that gives them the draw that the speed control can run. Will it run on this? Yes, it will. But will it have the snap and snork that you get out of the bigger ones? Not quite as much, but also the higher amp that you send to the speed control creates heat in the speed control and the motor so you have to keep an eye on your temperatures for that and of course in order to check temps we like to use one of these and it doesn't matter what model you get this is just a infrared checker and it'll tell you what your heat temperatures are on the speed control and on the motor and that's the important part when you first get your car and you go out and run it play with it in normal conditions take the top off really quick and shoot the motor and see what the number is. Okay, that's set up stock and that should be okay. We're running right around 120. That's not bad at all. 120 will run all day long. But if you start crawling up 145, 150, 160, you're geared a little bit high and you need to drop a tooth or two on your pinion to get it where it needs to be. As you change your gearing, make sure and check the temperatures and don't just check the motor guys make sure you check the speed control and it wouldn't hurt to shoot the battery to see if that's getting warm as well. And since we're touching on batteries, let's take a look at a couple of different batteries here. Now these two are the same, okay, as far as that goes. This is a 7.4 volt hex fly and this is only 20 C. So that means it'll only put out about 20 amps on the regular. However, this one is 50 C, it's 5200 and there is a sizable difference in weight. The more weight you add to the car, the more weight has to be moved around, the higher the amp draw. So if you take this one out and stick that big white one up there, it's easily three times the weight. Yes, that one's 6S, but just go with me on weight for a second because what it is is the difference in weight matters. It does to your temperatures. Now, this one being a small one, this is designed for a pretty small car and it'll work fine in that because that's what the car's speed control is designed for. 
This one, on the other hand, is designed for the larger cars that will run the higher amp draws. And we've never had any trouble running 50C and not burning things down. It's worked okay. I like to think of 50C as minimum. This one came with one of the cars. I would never go out and buy this battery. I would always go for something like this because if you have more available, okay, let's get into that just for a second. So this is 20C, okay? So at 20C, it only has 20 amps available to use. That's fine, the speed control will use all 20 amps. But if you have 50 available or 100 available, it will own, the speed control will only use what it can use and it won't touch the maximum. This number is maximum draw for steady current. It is not peak and it is not, um, everything has to run at 50. You can pull 30, watt, or 30 amps out of this with no problems and it'll run all day long up to 50. And beyond that, the, the other part of gearing, as far as that goes, before we actually get to what I know you guys are asking about, but is tires. And this is a huge deal. Now, I know these are different scale, but these will work for the demonstration. All right, so this is a really big tire. This one goes on a fifth scale car, but it weighs a metric ton, and there's four of these on the car. The motor has to be sized to handle this kind of weight or it will overheat. It won't have the power to drive them. It's gonna run like a slug and that type of thing. If this doubles the weight of the stock tires, you're gonna to have to look at your gearing because the more weight you add to the out, outside of this tire, the more amps it's gonna draw on startup and for control purposes. This is gonna be really difficult to run unless you modify things a little bit. However, a small tire like this will handle just fine because this is a stock tire that goes on the Vortex and it doesn't weigh much and it's not too big around, but the car is geared to handle this. So it'll go pretty fast with these on there. These don't swell up a whole lot and the gearing on this is right. But if you took and you swapped it out and I know, like I say, I know these are different scales, guys. This is example stuff. But if you went from this size to this size, your gearing's wrong for this one and it would not run without overheating. And it's not super big on the jump, but every jump counts. When you change the diameter or the weight of your tires, you're gonna have to look at your gearing, shoot your temperatures and make sure that they are still in the green. If you put these on it and it gets hot really fast, you're gonna have to meter how you run your car or change the gearing to make it work properly. This is what comes out of those cars, okay? And this is just your standard center differential with your spur gear on it. And this is the normal size, this is stock. And I'm sure you can get different ones for this to change your gearing up and everything. But at the same time, these come with a fairly small spur gear on them or a pinion on them. So these two marry up like this, okay? So this is the rotation of the motor. This is the one that runs the drive shafts. The drive shafts turn the differentials front and rear out to the tires and turns the tires. So your final drive will be slightly different. And I know I might be going a little fast for you on this. If you're new to this, here's the basics of it. This is the main one that gets driven. Okay, so this has the basic resistance of the entire car on this one. To get this to rotate, it has to turn all of the other equipment clear out to the tires. That's this one, okay? the motor has to be able to handle that. So this small pinion gives it enough torque to actually get it to turn without binding the motor. That's the important bit. Now, if you hop up to a bigger one and you have the same motor in it, this is gonna take a much harder grunt to get this to start turning because the gearing is now a lot taller on this one, which gives it less torque against this. Once it's rolling, the motor wants to spin up to whatever it's gonna be, 30,000 RPMs, whatever. When that spins up, this has the potential to go faster. And if you watch the pavement guys, they get out there and they run these and they'll have a pinion that's damn near that size. But the cars don't wanna take off on their own. They usually wind up using capacitors and all that stuff to hold enough charge to get it to go without cogging. And that's a problem as far as just playing around. I had a buddy that brought his, uh, he had a Traxxas, he brought it out, had the speed gear in it, didn't tell anyone. And we went out just to the oval track. Well, the oval track does require certain throttle control and yes, you get high speed up, but you gotta bear through the corners on that. 
he was running really fast and he was keeping up with the bigger cars and that was going pretty well. About two batteries in, his slash went up in smoke. <laughs> We're done here. And I went over and I looked at his car. I says, well, what happened? I took a look at his gearing and he had the speed gear on. The speed gear, guys, is designed for you to take your car out to the road, smooth surface, no resistance, run it down the road, as far as you can see it, turn it around and come ripping past as fast as you can once. Then you let the car cool down because the amps that you're drawing to pull a pinion that size, you're gonna be running maximum amperage out of that ESC to the motor, which is gonna overheat that motor. If you watch the guys that really do rip and they, they do these speed runs at 100 plus miles an hour, and 100 miles an hour is no joke, guys. It's, high, it's hard to get there. People seem to think they can do it like that, and you can't, you have to set your stuff up to do it, but there's more to it than just swapping opinion. Some of these guys run two motors to get the amount of torque necessary just to get the car running and drive past the resistance of the internals. So when you run two or four motors, you gotta have two or four speed controls, batteries for each, each thing adds weight. It's kind of a cascade. Can you get up to the super high numbers? You can, but each one of those cars is meticulously designed and built on bench by hand by these guys that are building them. It's really hard to find a limitless that's gonna do 200 miles an hour without being severely modified. And I mean severely, you watch a limitless go upside down at a, just reaching 100 because the torque ratio and the lift makes it because as you put the torque to the ground the tires try to lift the front end it's not just the wind resistance as the tires rotate there's counter rotation that goes against the chassis and as you put the torque to it it wants to lift the front end that's why there's a wing there to hold that down and some of them have custom built shells to push down on the front end because the rotation of the tires especially if they're rubber there's more inertia involved in those and it tries to pick the front end up. A lot of the guys that do the super high speed runs, they use foam tires so there's a lot less inertia and they can get things up and running. The gearing plays a good part of it, but the build of the car plays a lot more. All right, so let's get a look down inside of one of these. This is the Creighton 4S and this is the version two and it has a slipper back here. It does not have a clutch or a differential. It has a slipper clutch instead. It does have the ability to overslip one on the other, but basically if you tighten this up, it drives the front and the rear equally. That's fine. It still has the spur gear in here and the pinion, which is how you dictate your power to the car. The differentials are the same front and rear, and I like these because they have much bigger teeth on the pinions and the, the differential rings. But at the same time, there's a lot of mass involved in this. And when you stand on the throttle, it tries to lift the front end. That's just how that works because of the inertia it takes to move the tires. The rotation lifts the front of the car. When you hit the brakes, it dives. It's not that all the weight transfers to the front that way, which it does, but when you stop the inertia of the tires, it pulls down on the front end. That's how you control these in the air. And that's all driven by this. Now this motor here, it's pretty powerful and it does a pretty good job and this is quick and fun but at the same time if I change the gearing it wouldn't act at all the same way if I raised the gearing in this and took it up three or four teeth it would be fairly gutless off the line but it would go a lot faster in the long run but it would overheat right away so if I was going to change the gearing I'd move it one tooth try it shoot the temperatures make sure I'm in the safe zone move another tooth try it until I hit that sweet spot that I'm looking for little more speed not overheating and the time of day does pay attention to that if you're going to do it in the heat of the day on asphalt you're going to get a lot more heat inside the car definitely check your temps at that point because you want to make sure that the extra heat from the externals the area around it doesn't add to the heat that this is putting out you might have to drop your gearing on a really hot day because this won't be able to combat that. It can't vent the heat off if what's going through the fins is already hot. That makes a pretty big difference. So let's recap real quick and go over this one more time just in abbreviated fashion to get you on with it. In the car itself, there's a whole bunch of moving components that all play a role from tire size to the gearing in your outer differentials to the gearing at your center differential or, or slipper. 
right down to the pinion, motor size plays a role. You can put a bigger motor in it, which would require generally a bigger speed control. Now also inside the car, you have to keep an eye on battery capacity size. If you're gonna go from 4S to 6S, you may not have the battery tray to take that. So it's something you have to look into. At the same time, if you're gonna stay with the stock gear, in other words, motor speed control and all that good stuff, then you wanna move your gearing up one at a time. And what that means is, from one, which we have a very small pinion here, to this one is a giant leap. This is a huge jump and you're gonna have problems because it's already geared properly from the factory to get the best runtime for the gearing that's in it. Each time you add a tooth to the pinion, not the spur gear, but the pinion, it costs you runtime. It does, because it costs amperage to turn this. The harder this is to turn, the more amps it pulls out of the motor, the less time you have to play, the more heat is created. So when you go to something this size, let's say you're getting 40 minutes out of this one. You're goofing around the driveway, running through the grass, life is good, right? It's not getting hot, everything works good with a smaller pinion. And I'm not saying this pinion size, start with the one that comes in the car. But let's say you go with this one to start with, and you're running 40 minutes with this and it's running good. You got your batteries holding up, everything's good, nothing's getting hot. And you instantly jump it to this one and you get 12 minutes, 15 minutes because of the amp draw difference and your motor's getting hot, hang on tick. Your motor's getting hot and your speed control's getting hot because you're pulling way more amps and how you drive matters as well. If you're constantly on the trigger, zip, 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 you're pulling off the peak, not the continuous, and it's putting way more amperage through stuff and things will get hot, including the battery. So it's not a bad thing to do that, but be geared properly for it. If you're gonna play where you're constantly on the throttle and doing spin outs and wheelies and that kind of thing, smaller gearing is better because it'll handle that without pulling quite as many amps as it will if you have the big one in there. This one here is gonna cause you problems unless you're out on the road and you're just doing one or two speed passes and letting it cool down. Huge difference. And one last thing just before we get out of here, check this out. These are older school, but these are a good example. Each one of these has a different pitch. Okay, so these are spur gears that go on some of the older RCs like the low C's and the associated and whatnot. So each one has a different tooth design and you need to know what your pitch is when you go get another pinion. What I recommend is take the car with you when you go into the store, have a look at the pinion size, make sure that you get the right diameter pinion as far as what shaft the pinion goes on and make sure it marries up to the spur gear good. If you got the wrong tooth size, you'll just cause damage and it won't work. It's one of those things to where you get the right pinion for the right job. If you go in there and let's say you go into the hobby store with your car and you have a 13 tooth pinion on there. If you have one of those Arma cars that has the plastic unit for the slipper clutch assembly, it'll have numbers inside of that to say 13, 15, 17 as far as teeth on the pinion because those are indexed don't buy an in-between one because you won't get it to fit. You want to make sure and put in the one that it calls for. So if you're going to go from 13 and you're going to go up and there's no room for a 14, it's not on a slide, then you're going to want to get the next one up, which would be a 15, run that and test it. Always take it up slowly in increments and test it each time just to make sure you don't wind up causing damage. Keep in mind, speed control motor combos cost quite a bit and it's an expensive lesson to learn. So there you go, guys, RC Gearing 101. I hope that was simple enough. I hope that, that I covered all the, the bases for this so you understand how to choose. This isn't a matter of saying, oh, you've got this car, go buy this. It's not like that. You can do whatever you want to your car, do it carefully and do it in increments and you'll be all right. So hey guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to bash that like button and help our content spread. You know, we like doing these 101s and this video right here is a direct result of your comments. And we certainly do appreciate all the advice we get. So for AJ Jam Studios, I'm AJ saying, keep wrenching guys.